Beer is very consolidated. Two companies control 80% of the market. Oh. And five companies control 95% of the market. Why can't you buy beer on the internet? The director wanted me to teach the actor who was playing the doctor um, how to check for lymph glands. He's like, no, no, can it be more over towards um, the breast area? And I'm like, no, that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more than baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie, drinking beer is America's pastime. But you may not know there is a beer war going on. Large corporate breweries are engaged in a struggle to push small competitors out of the marketplace. Today, Annette Barron, director of the documentary Beer Wars, joins us. And later in the show, Kim Meredith. She's a real-life nurse and actress who's a medical advisor on some of the best-known medical shows. She keeps them from doing crazy things that would kill the patients. But up first, Annette Barron. Pleasure to have you here today, Annette. Great to be here. And I just want to set the record straight right up front that you were allergic to beer. That's right. I'm actually allergic to alcohol. Allergic to alcohol, but you've done, and I should say, by the way, I'm a, I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink beer, so we've got two non-beer drinkers here today talking about America's pastime. But you did a documentary about it. What, what led you to a documentary for a woman who's allergic to beer? Why did you do this documentary? Well, I think, first of all, it makes me very impartial, because the one thing I can't do is sit around sipping beer and making, me watch, and making you watch that for 90 minutes. I think there's nothing more boring than that. But what really led me to it was the fact that I actually had worked in the beer industry, thought right, it was fascinating, right. had worked in Hollywood before that, and thought oh. it might be cool to And you actually... don't drink after all. <laughs> and I still, I could not drink in any of those capacities, actually. And um, I just thought that the industry itself was really interesting, and there was something going on within the beer industry when I started making the film that I thought was very timely. And so that's how I got into it. So really, the film is not about drinking beer, although I hear from people who have watched it but they definitely want a beer by the time it's over. <laughs> you could have taste testings or something as you distribute this, you know. Right. Uh, you We've know. actually had um, in, in uh, some screenings uh, beer being served oh. during the screening itself. Maybe which means you could that get Anheuser-Busch like... to sponsor you. Um, I think if you see the film, you'll see the Anheuser-Busch. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, yeah. well, anything to sell a beer, you know. <laughs> right, yeah. I, don't think, I think this is the one thing that they're not going to sponsor. Not going to endorse. Okay. But you worked for, when you mentioned uh, the brewery you'd worked for, was Mark's Har Hard it, Lemonade? Mike's Hard Mike's Lemonade, Hard Lemonade. which okay. is actually not a brewery. It's a an alternative, but it mm. is a very successful brand in the beer industry. And this is not your father's lemonade, though. This is not your father's lemonade. This is actually alcoholic, mm. and it's sold right next to beer. Uh, very, very successful entrepreneurial company. And so I ran that company, and when I was running it, the people we were competing against were the large brewers. Mm. One thing that's interesting about the beer industry that's unlike other businesses, and when you go to the supermarket, you see that beer cooler. Uh -huh. Well, it only has so much room. And so for someone to come in, like a Mike's Hard Lemonade or like your local microbrew, somebody has to come out. And so mm. it's very, very competitive. So, so you really saw firsthand what's happening with these small, the craft breweries, I guess they call them, that are getting forced out by the big ones. And in some ways, too, that's really true across the board in America. You've got everything from, you know, the booksellers where like Barnes and Noble or Borders were pushing out the independents. Of course, now Amazon's killing them, but yeah, right. that's another story. Or you have your Starbucks, you know, and Coffee Bean that were taking over the coffee shops and that kind of a thing. So. Here, yet again, you've got another industry where, and that was kind of one of your themes, I think, in doing this, right? Again, that you've right. got these corporate behemoths that are just kind of taking over. Yeah, it's happening across the board. I mean, look at what Walmart's done to the mom and pop mm -hmm. stores. Yep. Um, you absolutely were right, mentioning bookstores. I mean, it's happening in products, it's happening in services. What's happening is the corporations are getting bigger and more consolidated, especially mm -hmm. in this economy they actually are getting together because it's harder to survive even as a big company. I mean, mm. we've seen, for example, what's happened in the auto industry right. uh, <laughs> and, and how they've had to get bought out. And so a lot of that happened in beer. And beer is very consolidated. Because you got, what, three companies that control? Actually, it's two companies control 80% of the market. Oh. And five companies control 95% of the market. And, so, and they are, of course, the biggie is... The, the big one is Anheuser-Busch, which controls 49.2%. So let's call it 50 and then you've got Miller Coors, which is a new company that was combined between Miller and Coors. And I didn't even know they had, go that shows you how in touch I am with beer. I didn't even realize they had merged, but they... Well, it's not something I think that the public really knows about, because I think these big companies don't necessarily want the public to know that they've merged. So there's still a Coors Light out there and a Miller Light and a Coors Banquet, as they call it, and all the Miller beers. And they, in turn, including Anheuser-Busch, own many, many different brands, hundreds of different right, brands right. that don't have the Coors label or the Miller label or the Anheuser-Busch label on it. 
so they can continue to control the shelf space. So it looks like there's all this choice, but it's really very controlled. Well, and it reminds me of, you didn't really talk about the soft drink companies in your documentary, but I know it's the same kind of thing, I think, with Pepsi and Coke, where they've bought up all these other drinks, you know, for mineral waters to, or flavored waters and all of this, you know, whether it's to grow their market share. Because, well, I think what you're saying is that they want to keep out competitors. They, they don't want people to come in, and if, and if the niche brands are gaining market share, they want to make sure they control those, or it's their brand that... Right. I mean, in soft drinks, you basically have two big companies. It's Pepsi and Coke, Coke being like the Anheuser-Busch, the, the bigger player. And when teas started doing well, iced teas, for example, or vitamin water, which is like a Mike's Hard Lemonade, if you will, a huge success story within the industry, that all took market share away from Pepsi and Coke. And so two years ago, I believe it was, Coca-Cola bought vitamin water for, are you ready? Four billion dollars. Uh, yeah. And so with Pepsi and Coke, they have something that the beer guys have as well, which is trucks. I mean, ultimately, the key for a small player is to get on a truck. Because without having the ability to get to the store, it's very hard to get on a shelf. Well, and you talk about the three-tier system, I guess is what they call it, which in some ways, well, it, it sounded good in theory, but in practice, it's really a way to shut out the little guys, what it sounds like. Well, the three-tier system was set up after Prohibition, which was kind of a failed experiment in America, which hopefully will never get repeated. Even for people like us who don't drink beer, I still want people to have access yeah, to whatever it is yeah. that they want. And so, um, you know, back in 1933, during repeal, it made sense to have a buffer between the store and the person who made the beer because, and this is just a little bit of history tidbit, but um, before Prohibition, we had what's called tied houses in America, mm. which meant that the tavern, there was a tavern on almost every corner, from what I hear, I wasn't around back then, and um, that tavern was actually owned by the brewer. Oh. So if you imagine that that was still able to happen today, if Anheuser-Busch had 50% market shares, then half the bars in America would be owned wow, and yeah. only serve their beer. And they so, wouldn't be checking IDs, I can tell you that much. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not going to comment on that or go there, but the point is that that limited competition. And so, in order to increase competition, the government, in its wisdom back then, got involved in regulating alcohol. So today, for example, alcohol is one of the uh, most regulated industries, 37,000 beer laws. Imagine you're a small guy, you and I maybe start a beer company. We have to navigate through more laws than any other small business in America in order to get our pro product to market. But to go back to the three-tier system, what's interesting about that is it did work for a while, but nobody had imagined back then that you would have this incredible consolidation. So today, for example, wherever you are across America, in, in, in the city that you live, there, it's, it's all set up as territories, and that territory has an Anheuser-Busch distributor and a Miller Coors distributor. And, I'm sorry, ahead. we need to take a break, but we'll be right back. Wholesalers or distributors are part of a three-tier system established after Prohibition to separate brewers from retailers. When the three-tier system was established, power was given to the states, who then split themselves into territories. So today, in most states, there are only two or three big distributors per territory which means that if you're a small brewer, you have to get on one of these trucks if you want to get your beer to market. Today, 70% of Anheuser-Busch distributors carry only their products, effectively shutting out small players. And we are back with Annette Barron, director of the documentary Beer Wars. Okay, so you were telling us about the three-tier system. Right, so, so, so that people's eyes don't glaze over. Basically, at the end of the day, the three-tier system was something that was established a long time ago, 76 years ago. And in my film, I make a case for it, not so much repealing it, but making some changes to update it to the 21st century. For example, why can't you buy beer on the internet? Well, would that be good or bad? I mean, I, I, truthfully, before I heard about the three-tier system, I probably would have been against it because you think they'd be selling to minors or, you know, like internet gambling or something, you know, which has some kind of a shady connotation. But yet, it sounds like, though, that might be the only, only way you get choice in the market, though. Well, if you look at wineries, I mean, many wineries sell Oh, they do sell the direct. Well, see, I don't drink, so right. I Right, exactly. So you've never done it. But, but I think that you can actually implement mm. proper controls. And the reason that you can't buy beer on the Internet is because of the beer lobby and its power. So, so they have a vested interest in making sure that, well, they don't want competition. 
Exactly. And, and I think what you said, what this illustrates is that another theme of this documentary is that people may think that there is consumer choice or when you go to the store you can buy whatever, you know, nobody's telling what beer to buy, but in reality it's not even going to get in the store. Right. I mean, it is getting better. I started the documentary four years ago and hmm. things have changed how, a how little so? bit. How has it gotten better? Well, the, the market has changed, and I think that in the last few years in America, people in general, and not a lot, but a minority, are starting to be more interested in local food. You see the growth of farmer's market, local right, cheeses, right. artisan chocolates, things like that. And the craft beers have started to grow with that. But again, you know, the one thing, and people always say, oh, you know, it's no big deal anymore. I can get it here, or I can get it there if I know where to go. But I think what we have to remember is all these craft Brewers, there are 1,500 of them in America today. Wow. They make up 4%, 4% of the beer market. So is it good? Is 4% enough? I, I don't know. It doesn't sound like enough to me. So then you have the biggies, though, who are also, you know, either trying to come up with their own, you know, niche brands or buy up the little ones, I guess, is another strategy. Yeah, I mean, what you find with the big companies, and look, this movie ultimately is about capitalism and free enterprise, and it asks a lot of bigger questions. So while it is about the beer industry, it's really about America today and where we are. And I think what happens is, you know, some people say that uh, when you copy something else, it's the most sincere form of flattery, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what the big companies do is they wait for someone else, like a Mike's Hard Lemonade or an organic beer to come out. Mm -hmm. They wait to see how it does. And then they go out and they make a very similar product, sometimes with a very similar name. But because they have the ability to get it in the store like that, they're in there. It looks small. It looks like it came from a small company. It's usually cheaper because they can make it for a lot less money. And so that's a way how to kill it. You know, it's either called category killer. Uh -huh. Well, the other thing, one of the most interesting things I think in this whole documentary was that when you did the taste test. Now, granted, it was unscientific. Most people could not even tell what beer they were drinking. They were completely, you had Anheuser, Busch, uh, Miller, and Coors at the time, which were separate. And people were, everybody was guessing the wrong, you know, the beer, the Coors people couldn't tell the Coors and the Anheuser Busch people couldn't tell. So do you think that's true that people, you know, is it just image and perception and marketing and people don't really know or care what beer they're drinking? Well, because I don't drink or I can't drink, it was really interesting to me to go out to bars and to find out if these claims are true. Because you walk around and people go, I'm a Bud guy. You know, I'm a Miller guy. I'm a Coors guy. And I, I just had this idea of what would happen if I actually brown bagged it, literally, and showed people that maybe they really aren't as loyal to their beer that they think they know as they are. And in my non-scientific, I mean, it's not scientific because I don't know how you make it scientific. It's kind of like the Pepsi challenge, if you will. Yeah. But I, you know, I went around the bar and I asked people, what are you, what are you drinking? And could you tell it apart? And they're all like thumping their chest. Yeah, yeah, of course I can tell it apart. But at the end of the day, Very few people 90% to get it right. got it wrong. Wow. That's something. But you know, what's more interesting than when, and I didn't put this in the film is that afterwards, right? They're sitting there with three different beers because they tried the three different beers. And you say to them, so now which one are you going to take with you? What are you going to keep drinking? And most of the people said that they would drink the one that they picked. So this whole idea of brand loyalty, hmm. what people are buying into is the television advertising, the sponsorship, hmm. the Clydesdales, whatever that is sure. that they think sure. makes them that person. And it's they image. make sure they're everywhere to, to be a part of that whole baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, American. You know, one thing I want to say, though, um, you know, I love traveling, going to Europe, and I hear a lot about European beers. I thought what I hear is American beer sucks. Does an American beer suck? Well, again, we can't really comment because I can't comment on how it tastes, but Michael Jackson, who's in the film, a different Michael Jackson, so let's not go there, but he was, until he died two years ago, the world's foremost beer expert. And he says that today in America, we make the best beers in the entire world. And beer. as a matter of fact, I get emails all the time from brewers in Europe telling me how they want to see the film and how they're emulating some of the brewers that are in the film. So. It's because really you think of German beers or Czech beers or something. Now I'm getting over my head already. That's about as far as I can go with it. But, but, you, so, but the American beers are actually hold their own. Well, they, they hold their own because the brewers are experimenting. So actually a Belgian beer is called that because it turns out it's not because it's from Belgium, but because it's a Belgian style of beer. Same with, with 
Czech beer. And so you can repeat that style anywhere in the world, but what's happening in America is the brewers are really experimental. They're adding crazy things, like they're making chocolate beer, or they're making beer with raspberries, or with pumpkins, things that you would not, you and I would certainly not associate with beer. And that's one of the reasons why they appeal to this new market that's growing, because they don't taste like the watered-down, bland, bland. What, what these guys call Bud Miller Coors as one word, beers. <laughs> well, we're, we're almost out of time, but one thing I do want to ask you about, um, is when you talk about the American breweries and the advertising budgets and the way it's kind of imposed on people, but you know, I think of some places like where Germany, though, where you know it's just such a part of their culture in Bavaria and beer drinking. I mean, do you think does it go beyond? You know, it's not just the big companies drooling it in their head. They just love beer. I mean, Germans love beer. I mean, do you think there's could there be more to it than just corporate advertising or? Could I Americans think, just like beer? Well, I think obviously Americans like beer. I mean, 60% of Americans who drink, and obviously we're not in that number, but they prefer beer over wine and spirits. So mm. it is more widely drank than, than any other beverage, alcoholic beverage in America. I think Americans do like beer, but I think what you have here that you didn't have in Europe or anywhere else in the world is prohibition. Mm. And that really changed Americans', atti Americans' attitudes towards alcohol in general. Thank you very much, Annette. Baron, the Thank documentary you. is Beer Wars. We'll be right back with Kim Meredith of MedTech. And we are back. Joining me now is Kim Meredith. She plays a nurse on TV, and she's one in real life, and also a med tech who help a med tech who helps TV shows get their medical facts right. Great to have you here today, Thanks Kim. Thanks for having me, Greg. You can also see her in a recent issue of Emmy Magazine talking about her med tech career. But it's interesting, you went into nursing to, to be a day job to support your acting, but that led to a whole other career for you. Exactly. I was an actress um, working on shows and doing theater and plays and working at the actor studio. And things were kind of up and down, and my grandma was kind of like, you need to go back to school and get, a real get job. something else. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I got into nursing, and then I wound right back up back into the entertainment business again. Mm. Um, my agent sent me out on a couple auditions to play a nurse in commercials, and I booked those and was acting in a couple of um, commercials with that. And then I started doing uh, nursing roles, like on General Hospital. Uh -huh. And then that's where this whole med teching thing started. The um, producer there said, well, can you also med tech uh, the scene that you're doing? I worked with Bruce Springsteen on there, oh, which wow, is really wow. cool. So yeah. what, did you, what did you do with Bruce Springsteen? Um, well, I was his uh, OR nurse, so basically... Was he being operated helping. on or something? Or? Uh, no, he was, he's the main doctor, yeah. Oh, he was a doctor? Oh, I didn't yeah. know that, okay. <laughs> so then I was like, this is really great. I can be in, you know, around actors and being creative, and I can also help teach them how to do, you know, things medically correct. And sometimes they need some help. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are they, in fact, I love the, one of the stories from one of the soaps. Uh, can we say the name or not? Uh, um... You don't want to well, say I don't want to say the name of the okay. soap, but it was a, one of the actresses portraying a, 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 a patient who has, um, you know, lymphoma, mm. and uh, the director wanted me to teach the actor who was playing the doctor um, how to check for lymph glands. And I was like, well, here, and, you know, under the arms. And he's like, no, no, can it be more over towards um, the breast area? And I'm like, no, that's not going to work. You know a, how the soaps are, you yeah. know? So that was a little awkward. And then sometimes I'll be, like I was on a show where I was med teching recently and it's out of a real hospital we we're shooting mm. and an actual uh, people were coming into the emergency room while we were shooting. So that was pretty crazy. And oh, they were wow. actually had major injuries. And I'm oh. telling them, we, this isn't real. We it was can't very help surreal. You came to the wrong hospital. And they're like, no, this is real. We're like, no, everybody here is dressed up and we're not. Uh, uh, but know. the other, the real hospital people were somewhere around the corner or what, what happened? There was, there's another hospital up the street, but they had closed this hospital down oh, so we could shoot oh, in it. wow. Yeah, so. Did you try to help the people or you just, you couldn't? You just had to send well, them to the right hospital? Well, a couple hospital. of our real, because there's real on-camera nurses that work on shows and they do like all the real medical stuff, um, so it looks real. So some of our real on-camera nurses were like, I want to go help, but we're not supposed to because, um. Legal liability yeah, probably and everything liability, else. Yeah, and... So we just called 911 and paramedics came to the rescue. Wow, wow. So even when you're trying to do a TV show, you end up getting wrapped up in the real, real thing. Yeah, it was an incredible experience. <laughs> now, one yeah. show, though, um, like to say Code Red, but can I, can I say the show name or not? Was it 24? Oh, yeah, 24. Yeah, I was uh, med-taking one day on 24, and 
they were saying it was the code blue, which I love doing codes on camera. Um, and, and a code, they is, saying is, code, yeah, it's cardiac arrest. Cardiac arrest. And um, they were saying stuff like code red, and I was like, no, that means fire. So like you know, <laughs> Close helping enough. out with stuff like that, yeah, and or you know, wanting to put ET tubes down, uh, you know, the, the actor's throat. Can when we say the actor's name on that one? Well, he's a great actor, uh, Rob Lowe, and he he said, no, I don't want to do anything that's not medically correct, so we did it the right way, and Ken Olin is a great director, and Brothers and Sisters episode I did, and it's nice when you find a director that really wants it done medically correct and okay. takes the time because yeah, you said, you to know, work but, with the med tech. But how often do they get it right? Because I know you said that, I mean, there's... You know, real life medical, and there's Hollywood medical. I mean, right. even on the, the the good shows, do you have to make some concessions to um, the story or yeah, TV? Yeah, certain or? things we have. You know, we have monitors and we have equipment that we use uh, simulating it to make it look real. And we've got gurneys going down halls with monitors. We're stuffing, you know, wires underneath blankets and stuff to make it look real. But when some uh, you know, certain things are okay, moving a patient in a room, you know, the wrong way if we have to cut corners with the camera, but certain things are not okay, like I was explaining the ET tube, you know, going down someone's throat, an actor's throat, way before he has a major speech, that's you, not going to happen. They wouldn't be able to talk? You wouldn't be able to talk, no, you can't talk like that. But there are a lot of directors that um, really do want to make it work and they really will take the time to go over everything. And there is a lot of actors that are great, but some actors get very claustrophobic and they Meaning, get scared. Okay. Um, having all those wires connected oh. to them, the nasal cannula, um, they get a little claustrophobic, and but some want to just dive in and just you know do whatever to me. You know, I want it to be as real as possible. And are there some some shows that just nail it that just go by the book pretty much on everything? Or? Yeah, I think ER is a good example of that. Um, Grey's Anatomy is great. They have a great med tech there. She's really accurate, and the directors and producers there are really just right on. So yeah, there are some shows out there that are that are great. And I know one of your biggest things was on Brothers and Sisters. Yeah. Yeah. What did you do for them? Um, I did, um, I med teched for the show. I broke the script down. We ordered the right materials that needed to be done. Um, we were doing a cardiac arrest uh, mm. scene and a code scene and a cath scene. So um, prepped all the actors, rehearsed. And what's great about doing codes with having real on-camera nurses with you, it just goes so smoothly because you've got CPR going and mm. You need to make sure, it's, it's nice when you have the on-camera nurses that are real nurses that know how to work in front of the camera, because then a lot of times the actors or the extras aren't going to know how to do compressions, and it sure. gets hard to make it look really real, so it's nice you kill the when other you have that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you get hurt with the CPR or something like that. <laughs> no, you have to be very careful with all that stuff, definitely. Now, this has actually kind of given you another career avenue as well, though, because you've come it up has. with the idea for a show. It has. Well, for many years, I mean, I've been in the medical profession for probably 11 years now, and I have a lot of medical ideas. Hmm. And um, I have a writing partner now um, named Chris Darling, who's a great television writer. Hmm. And we are developing a medical drama um, that's be never been DR. done before. Yeah, it's never been done, um, and it's, it's, it's going to have a lot of new and exciting things medically and uh, challenging medical stuff on it, so it would be great. And you also have something coming up, uh, Three Rivers? I just worked on Three Rivers, which is an organ transplant show. It's going to be coming out in a few weeks, and it was really refreshing. The med tech on there was just amazing, so professional. Um, and it, it, it's never been done before about you know organ transplant, so it's... Neat. I like it. I like it better than the, the uh, medical shows where all the kissing, dating stuff's going on. I mean, this, I, mean I like <laughs> the, that the too Melrose because that's, kind that's, of, uh... that's important, but um, this is more like... Uh, well, that would never happen in a real hospital, would it? Oh, yes, it happens oh. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is good and good. Let's talk about that. But you said we there are a lot of politics in this, though, too. There are poli romance aside, there are also politics in this, though. In, um, in the med tech? Yeah, side. in the med teching, it is. Um, it's funny because there's a lot of politics in nursing, but in um, in, in an acting and anything in the entertainment business. But med teching is because there's, there's a f not that many med techs out there. And the ones that are out there really don't want to let any. <laughs> 
young and fit. Oh, they, got, oh, <laughs> like really they got a good thing going and they want to yeah, keep it to themselves. Yeah, oh. so, but I've been fortunate. A few Meditechs have been very kind to me and referred me out and stuff, but so it's been nice. Well, thank you very much, thank Kim you for Meredith. Me. You can see her in Emmy Magazine and coming up on Three Rivers. She's not just a nurse on TV, she's one in real life, too. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next time.